testing. You don't have to be so quiet. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. We'll be with you in just a few moments. Yes, it does make us nervous when you're so quiet. <laughs> so if you could raise the volume of your chatter just a little bit. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for the Hinkle Lecture Number Two, Uncovering the Credo. I am Brian McWhorter, and I'm pleased to introduce our guest, the winner of the prestigious La Maestra Competition in Paris, the Taki Alsup Fellowship Award recipient, and many other achievements and accolades, as well as the Young Promoter of Poland Award recipient, she has collaborated with orchestras in Poland and abroad. Please welcome our conductor for the Credo, Anna Sokoska Migo. <laughs> and we're also pleased to uh, have Kathy Saltzman Romy with us, the director of choral activities at the University of Minnesota, where she oversees the graduate program in choral conducting and conducts choirs. She is also artistic director of the 200-voice symphonic chorus, not 201, 200, 
the Minnesota Chorale, which serves as principal chorus for the Minnesota Orchestra. Romy has served as a staff member to the Oregon Bach Festival since 1984 and is chorus master of the Festival Chorus, which she prepares for annual concerts, commissions, and recording projects. Please welcome Kathy Saltzman Romy. <laughs> so we're here to talk about Penderecki's Credo. But I wanted to start with just talking a little bit about some personal things. So I think, as many of you probably want, as do I, I'd like to know a little bit more about you, Anna. Um, you have quite a list of accomplishments already, and you're relatively new to the scene, if I may say that. Um, congratulations on all your success. Um, I'm curious what it is about conducting that you are enjoying the most right now. So, so uh, long story short, uh, I never thought that uh, I will be conductor. My father is conductor, so I knew this job from the very beginning, and it was always natural for me. So, when some, you know, when you when you have conductor in family, you s you think that others children also have, and it's usually like that. So when I discovered that it's not um, one of the most um, simple jobs in the world, um, we traveled a lot, but uh, later at the school I observed that my father had to travel a lot without us. And I wasn't interested in that, uh, because I knew that uh, I want to be at home, I want to have family, I want mm. to be mother. And um, during, the, during the studies, um, I studied uh, viola, yeah, music, <laughs> um, so um, I was very frustrated because I discovered that I can't, um, I can't describe and share my musicality by the instrument. I didn't know why, it was too high stress. I was so focused to play right notes and um, I panic all the time. Like when I had the concert, the evening, the whole day, it was disaster. Mm -hmm. and, um, and at the same point, I organized as a, as a leader in many groups, many events. Um, um, I, was, I was and I'm still a scout uh, association. Uh, it's like scouts boys and girls mm -hmm. in the United States. It works a little bit different in my country, but it's similar. So I did a lot of things, and at, at the same point, my father told me, you know, maybe you can, you can think about the conducting just to be a better musician. Don't think about the profession, because he knew how it's hard. And uh, my mom always said, um, yeah, I think you should do it and, and just try. So after the first concert as a conductor, because I thought, no, conducting, why? <laughs> but um, so I started, I started just for my parents a little bit, you know, I, I, I was living with them, so. Um, and when, when I had the first concert, it was one of the best feelings in mm. my life. I realized that I am on the stage exactly when I want to be, and mm. it was so big pleasure. And even if I was stressed before, I really remember the, the moment, and it's always like that now, that before the performance, I think about the, the very difficult places, and then doors are open, mm -hmm. I see the light, and it's time for the show. I, I love that, and I love this um, place when I can think, when I see the orchestra, the choir, and my message is, don't be stressed, I am here, and I can't tell you how it's possible that I was so stressed with the instrument, yeah. not as a conductor, but it works like that for me. So when I hear about the about the this uh, winner things yeah. and and the, the the achievement, I'm quite overwhelmed <laughs> um, because I I want to prove that I am still the same Anna and. Um, Sometimes people expect that you know you are maestro. I don't know. I, I just want to be a conductor and sure, um, I want to do my job very well and as, as good as possible, but uh, I'm afraid to 
to make the you know too big distance between maestro and and the rest mm. uh, like i really take her about good relation in the orchestra in the choir just to repeat the sentence in my mind that i am no one without the people mm. who plays and who sings mm -hmm. I can conduct right now, hold the credo. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a point for me. So I really enjoy conducting, um, especially with the orchestra and the choir, because at home it's not so interesting. <laughs> Great, I love that, that um, you said early on, conducting why, I'm wondering, Kathy, have you ever thought that? <laughs> Am I, is this sounding? No. Okay, now it is. Um, I just told my cousins that when I was in third grade, I told a little boy, he said, what are you going to do when you grow up? And I said, I'm going to be a conductor. My father was a conductor. Yeah. I will be a conductor. And he said, you can't be a conductor, you're a girl. Yeah. And I said, I'm going to be a conductor. <laughs> and then I graduated from this institution in flute performance and he, with the same young man, he was in physics and he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to Germany to study conducting. And he said, you told me that in the third grade. Yeah. So I was studying flute performance here and I knew almost instantly this is not my calling. But they didn't offer conducting for undergraduates. Mm -hmm. It's a different system. And so I played and learned the repertoire and enjoyed it. Oh. My score is falling down. Um, but but I moment. knew that that's what I wanted to do. Uh -huh. Because of the connection with people and the way that you are able to interact with text and music, mm. I, I felt called to that. And I, I love to play the flute, but I knew that I did not aspire to great things. I was not a great flutist. I was a good flutist. Mm -hmm. But I knew I would probably get a job in a B orchestra playing third flute every mm. third you know, 30 measures, the third of the chord, and yeah. I just thought, I, I don't need it. I, that's not who I am. Right. So I really wanted to teach, I wanted to conduct, and I wanted to engage with text mm. and music mm. and people. Kathy, this is, uh, it's got to be a heavy festival for you this particular year. I wonder if you could talk to us about how you're doing and how it's feeling. Well, it's not an easy summer. Um, it's the first summer without my father here. Yeah. Uh, but we had this wonderful celebration of life for him on Thursday. Yeah. And I think what is meaningful to us as a family, to me, and to our community is mm -hmm. his impact and his legacy. I didn't think I'd get too emotional, but I am. Yeah, he connected with this community in many, many ways but also with the national, international choral community. So I think his legacy was made apparent uh, in our celebration of life, and I feel his presence here, and he would be so proud that you're here conducting, mm. uh, because you have to say that your father was a member of the conducting class when this piece was performed. Yeah. So that's the legacy, yeah. that young conductors came here to the Oregon Bach Festival from over 30 different countries and engaged with music making and education, performance, and then they went back and and they carried part of that with them, and did you know and are doing amazing things in their lives and in their countries, and that's what I think is really important about the Oregon Bach Festival, is how many lives were impacted through the vision of Royce and Helmut, but you have to say something about your father. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, and I, I so appreciate that you're here and that you were willing to talk about that. I know that, uh, well, my heart goes out to you, I'm sure, from everyone here. The festival mourns, the musical community of the world mourns. So, um, all my condolences. But to think that my father and Helmut yeah. made possible Anna's father yeah. to come here and work in the conducting master class in the year that this piece was premiered. Yeah. That's extraordinary, it, isn't it? It is, it is. So let's talk about that. Yeah, especially that when, when I got um, when I got invitation and uh, for, for this festival and uh, I, I shared, you know, this um, 
news with, with my parents. I was very excited, Oregon, Oregon Bach Festival, United States, credo, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and my father told me, you know what doesn't mean for me. I, I, didn't, I didn't know because you know, it was a lot of places. I remember that he, he had a scholarship. I remember that it was his beginning of wow. the real job and of, with the career because you need, to, you need to know that 30 years ago and 25 years ago in Poland, it wasn't so easy to go abroad and mm -hmm. to money is a completely different story because the currency was like one dollar, it was almost 30 zlotys and later less and less, but it was huge amount of the money. So if master classes costed $1,000, it yeah. was almost $30,000 zlotys in Poland. It was insane, like car. So, so it wasn't possible for them to go abroad. And when your father and 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 Helmut, when they did, when they ha gave the possibility for the young conductors to come here, they pay for them a lot of you know money f even for the traveling. It was different, different level of it. It wasn't even the scholarship. It was the dream. Mm. So. My father, when he discovered that, he told me, you know, conducting, it was, of course, the one thing and the whole music experience which, which I get. But I know how play in Frisbee, thanks to Oregon Bach Festival. <laughs> you know, I had great, I have still great uh, colleagues from this um, festival. They gave me another life and they gave me power to believe I can be conductor. Mm. So, um, of course, he was during uh, this uh, Christoph Penderecki uh, premiere and later in Krakow we had one of the, it was the premiere because the, our hometown, Krakow, was also a city of Christoph Penderecki. So uh, he prepared orchestra for, for as assistant for this concert. And um, as we know, uh, you remember my father. So it's also a big surprise w when we discovered it two days ago. And I'm really, I'm really moved. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel that part of my, my father is so grateful and it's so beautiful experience that he can share part of his life in my body mm -hmm. uh, to say I am so grateful that you know I can pass baton and my experience which I get here uh, many years ago so um, yeah that's a whole circle of life you yeah. know <laughs> indeed that's amazing um, and I, let's come back to your father uh, in a minute I'm, I'm struck uh, after reading through this original program notes for the, for the premiere in 1998. Of course, this piece was being composed, well, he, Penderecki says between 97 and 98, although I think he was starting somewhat earlier than that, perhaps. But I'm struck by this letter that he wrote to Helmut, um, saying that instead of a full mass, we're going to have just a credo. Well, I don't mean just a credo, but we're going to have a packed credo. Let's say it this way. Um, and very apologetic, I, or there's some humility here. Uh, I hope that's okay with you, essentially. But what I'm really struck by is the date of the letter. May 9th, 1998. And the premiere was July 11th, if I have that right. <laughs> Now, for any of us that are involved in production um, or have premiered pieces before, to see that this letter came in it on May 9th, when I saw that and I put two and two together, I started panicking <laughs> 25 years later. And I was in the orchestra for the premiere, um, and I remember some kerfuffle. But Kathy, I'm wondering if you could help us understand what it felt like backstage from May 9th to July 11th. It was an email, right? It was an email. It was an email. I think it was a fax. Right. It's fax. Uh, 
A fax. So, Remember faxes? <laughs> How about overhead projectors? Uh, I brought my original piano vocal score, which is in seven different sections. So when he would complete a section, Penderecki would send it, it would be transcribed, uh, and then I would receive it and study it. Same for Helmut. What you see up there is um, an enlargement of his full score, which I also have here. Uh, so you can see it's all, it was all handwritten and had to be then printed, transcribed and printed. Oh. So when we got to the festival and it still wasn't finished because it was finished one week before the premiere, um, you know, and the festival starts up and we're still waiting for that et vitam, that final, um, <laughs> final section. And, uh, and I distinctly remember that Christoph, you know, he was writing in his hotel, but he would also appear at concerts, at receptions. And Helmut came over to my father one day and he said, why is he here at this reception? He should be back in his hotel composing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was Christoph. So, you know, he, um, that final section of Et Vitam, which is very powerful. Mm. So if he finished it one week before the festival, as you remember, it still had to be transcribed, printed. And so the joke was, we would be on stage like the dress rehearsal or even the performance, and they would fax in the final pages and we'd be passed out <laughs> to all of the performers and then we would just do it on the spot, oh. kind of like a Bach cantata or something. Oh. Um, and in this full score, if you want to look at it, there are markings. This, this is a, um, a photocopy of my full score with Helmut's markings. And I went back and I have 13 copies of the third to the last page and I cannot find the second to the last page or the final page. So I, don't, I just don't know where they are. Yeah, right. But I have 13 copies to op auction off. Oh, uh, <laughs> I'll take one. Okay, yeah. Uh, so it, yeah. It, it's just fascinating to think about that creative process. But Christoph Feld, I mean, he started with the credo because that was his faith statement. Yeah. A deeply religious man. Yeah. He started with the heart of the mass and then he came to the end of it and he said, and that's all I have to say. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder, before we leave this particular topic, you've seen, you've worked with Helmut for many, many years. Um, have you ever seen him as stressed as this particular week? I love this anecdote of him saying he shouldn't be at this reception. <laughs> he should be composing. In his hotel. In his hotel. Mm. Have, you, have you ever seen him as stressed? Maybe not. I, and, you know, Helmut was... Really, I would say he, he took it all in. I mean, he, he knew it would be completed. He would just have liked it a little sooner. I think all of us would have liked it yeah. a little sooner. I, I remember we, we, you know, we had, it's a big deal to record, especially this large of a piece, and certainly it's a big deal to record a piece by Penaretsky. Um, and I, I was fresh out of my undergrad. I had just graduated for, for that particular season. And I remember thinking, Where's the music? Because <laughs> normally you'd have it a month before or something like this. And well, and, and the thing about a premiere, as we all know, is that changes occur in the rehearsal. Oh, yeah. So it's not that you just put the music in front of us and then we do that. We, there are still errors in this notated score, this newly notated score. There are still errors that were not corrected from that premiere that I have corrected. So I'm going to send the publishers an annotated list of all the corrections that need to be put into the new score, yeah. including text, rhythm, uh, note errors, all kinds of things. It's one thing for Helmet to have to deal with, I mean, he's got to learn the score, he's got to get into rehearsal and go. But your job is a little bit earlier if I, as chorus master. You've got to train the, the chorus on the piece before Helmet ever gets in front of them. So I was asking about Helmet's stress, but what was your stress like? I think it was equal to Helmut's. I mean, we, I had the bulk of the score. I knew it was not too much that was left, yeah. and we were just hoping it would not be as difficult as what we had just <laughs> prepared. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, I think that w what's remarkable to me and Anna commented on this, and I would like her to talk mm -hmm. about it because I prepared the premiere here, also in Krakow, okay. I was involved in that. In Stuttgart, I was involved in that. 
the remounting of it here again in Germany. Mm -hmm. So I've been part of numerous performances of this work in the early stages of it. And it was so much easier this time around. I mean, it is a daunting piece to prepare. It's a daunting piece to conduct. But we have a recording. Mm -hmm. We've got a notated score. Mm -hmm. We've got information you know, about how to approach it stylistically, mm -hmm. yeah. which we did not have then. So it was stressful because we wanted to do a wonderful job with it, and we wanted to really be able to convey it with meaning and conviction. Yeah. And when it comes up to the last moment, if you're uncertain, mm -hmm. as you know, mm -hmm. as a performer, you don't always do your best work. But. Right. To Anna's point, mm -hmm. Helmut got on the podium and he led it with mastery. He really did, and the whole performance was incredible. Um, I'm wondering, Anna, would you have preferred to have received the score a week before the performance <laughs> this time, just to get into the mood of what was 25 years ago? You know, I have no idea how you did it. <laughs> really, I, I, I. You, you were talking about the preparing the choir, but you have to be prepared before a rehearsal with the choir. So have you slept, you know, during this, this week, you know, 25 years ago, every night with this course or ha ha how it looked? Because I can't imagine a situation that, um, okay, to be very honest, it's, it's not like, uh, because of the full schedule in, in my season, it's not like that, that I had three months with this course for the credo. But I, but I know this piece from even the hearing, because I assisted one year ago. So I had many months to even sometimes think about it 15 minutes mm -hmm. or one hour. Yeah. And it's a huge piece. It's really difficult piece. Yeah. And it's very funny because you said that you were sure that he finished that. I wasn't, I wouldn't be so sure <laughs> because, <laughs> because the, uh, Krzysztof, uh, he always had a problem with the um, deadlines. deadlines. Yeah. And uh, you know, in Europe, uh, we had situ, I didn't have, but there was, not only one situation when they needed to reschedule for the two years. I remember that. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. Good for you. What is it with composers? <laughs> let's just say there was Helmut and there was Royce. Yeah. And between those two men, they made that happen. Yeah. Well, and a lot of credit goes to you as well. No, no doubt about it. Uh, every, by the way, every time one of these falls. <laughs> I think of a fax machine with the music coming out, just making that same sound. So I think that we should just enjoy that. Every time one of them falls, let's just, we'll get back into the mood. Anna, what is so difficult about this piece uh, from your vantage point? Okay, so uh, f from my point, first uh, of all, is that um, I think I'm still young. And, um, and you know, when you see the piece, which is one of the statement of the composer, um, because the, as you can also read in, in, in his book, um, in, in Christoph Penderecki book, um, he said, I knew that it's time where I need to answer the question, do I believe? So it was really connected with him. Mm -hmm. And when, when I opened the score, I know it's not only, it's not only the music, it's music connected with his soul. Mm. And it's very important to be serious and to be mature. So I was quite afraid because I, I, when my agent called me, um, and Bridget asked me, okay, Anna, do you think you can manage choir and orchestra? I said, it's not a like, big deal. It's not the worst thing for me to manage choir and orchestra because I love choir. I work with the choir um, in Poland two years, and it's completely different bound with the choir. Mm. You know, the, I, I love it. I really love it, and I miss it a lot um, this season. So, I, but I said to Bridget, I need to think about if I'm to if I'm ready for for that. So um, I, I said to her, I will give you answer tomorrow. And when I, uh, of course, I talked to my father, yeah. and uh, when we discovered this, because I assisted to this um, piece one year 
ago in Krakow, so I remembered how it's difficult. I prepared um, children choir, and it was enough difficult for me. So, and my, my father told me, Anna, you have to remember that you are not the same conductor like one year ago, it's first thing. Second, this piece, it's part of your soul too because you are from the same country. You know a lot of you know, the, the melodies uh, which are included in this piece. So take it not only as a goal, but also as an adventure. Mm. And try to just be yourself, you will do it. So I thought, okay, if I'm not ready now, how I will, when I will be ready? Of course, in 20 years, for sure, I will conduct it maybe differently because it's part of being conductor, right? Mm -hmm. You are more experienced and more and more and more. So I'm very grateful that I have so experienced a choir master with mm. me and I always ask, okay, what do you think? Mm. Tell me, don't hesitate because I really want to also it's normal that sometimes someone can have better idea than you. Mm. So for me, it's challenging to also, and not just to be ready with the score, but to think about very deeply. Mm. And of course, uh, when we think about the um, piece, just the technical, it's very difficult because we have a lot of changing of the metrum, metrum, mm. meter, meter, no. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, so uh, it's not f like easy one, two, three, four. Sometimes you have one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two. So you have to be awake all the time. Mm -hmm. You have <laughs> really like yeah. very con concentrated, not only me, whole orchestra, choir. Um, it's not uh, for, the, for the soloists, they have so difficult parts and they, they, they had to practice with the piano many days mm. and weeks because there's the type of melodies yeah. you don't uh, sing like happy birthday you really need to find the chromatic yeah. and the way of the direction the music so it's not easy going sometimes it when you listen that you you can have feeling oh it's not so hard is it hard it's yeah. really hard and difficult challenging instruments um, around the whole um, yeah, it's multitasking. Yeah. And we both talked about the fact it starts, like the, the first half of the piece is not oh, as yeah. difficult to conduct, but the second half of the yeah. piece, it gets harder and harder and harder. It, I would say the very end is not that difficult either, mm. but moving into the end through the Ed Resurrexi, yeah. that whole section, and it, it's, it is challenging. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, yeah, I completely agree with Anna. You just have to be with the score and understand it. And then sometimes I did not look at the chorus. I've got choristers in here. I said, I'm not going to look at you. I'm not going to think about you. I'm just thinking, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three. Yeah, you know, right. Because the text, he doesn't set the text in a natural way in some of these spots. Uh huh. Intentionally. Yeah, yeah. And I understand what he's trying to achieve, but. It's not easy. It's it's not easy for the chorus. It's not easy for the conductor, the orchestra. Right. By the way, how many people in the audience were at the premiere in 1998? Wow. Oh, wow. That's wow. great. Wow. I I went back and in preparation for this talk, I went back and listened to our recording. And it is funny. At least for me, I wonder if you have the same experience, Kathy. That all the notes just came flooding back, all, every second of the piece. I didn't think that I was gonna actually remember it. Um, but I went back and listened. Of course, I'm struck by uh, Milagro and Thomas Kostoff and um, j just these voices that I, I, I remember so well from the recording. Um, I wonder, have you listened recently? Oh, yes. And tell me, tell me how it is for you. It was the same. Yeah. And what came flooding back is the recording session because we had this one little section, and this was yeah. kind of towards the end in all of that mixed meter, which eluded us. We were not getting a clear take. And, um, and I think we got the, the best take like in the last minute. Uh -huh. And I know that my father was up there watching his clock. Oh, 
please don't go into overtime. Right, please. right. Um, and we were just waiting, and it was like five seconds before this before session we, ended, and we got it, and there was a pause, and everybody went, hooray! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did it! That was, that was really wonderful, but it, it, was, it was a challenging. Um, yeah. Not only the performance, but the recording sessions were challenging, and all of that came flooding back. The music, the experience of you know, preparing and presenting it, mm. and then those recording sessions. Just after, yeah, basically like a patch session or two. Yeah, I think it was two. Two, two patch sessions. Yeah. 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 If I can add, this recording is really good. When I compare it to the folder recording <coughs> of this piece, yeah, 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 yeah you, you have to know that. And I am so impressed that you did it so good in the short amount of the time because I can compare it to the Polish recordings, which I know that they spend a lot of time. Of course, sometimes it's also um, connected with the hall, and yeah, yeah. they are just to be precise. But wow, you did great, great job. There was a really? lot of adrenaline in the room, <laughs> not having the music until a week before. But um, yeah, it, it's so chromatic, this piece. I mean, of course, it, it's a, this is a tonal piece, and that's notable for Penderecki at this time. Um, he had moved into this uh, different part of his compositional career. The piece is largely tonal, but it is relentlessly chromatic. I think right, but you have to understand what that chromaticism means. Let's go. So, Here I'm just going to go to the piano, and Anna already knows this, but um, yeah. Penderecki, <laughs> so you know, there is, a, historically, there is the figure, the lamento bass, a chromatically descending fourth. And Bach uses it, uh, and many composers use it to, to describe lament. So Penderecki intentionally used this figure, the lamento bass, throughout the entire work. And he inverts it, going up, So I just encourage you to listen for that because if it's inverted, if it's going mm -hmm. upward, it shows, I mean, downward is kind of the crucifixion and the passion of Christ. Upward is what the crucifixion meant mm -hmm. in terms of ascension and resurrection. Oh, thank you. And Penderecki, I mean, this piece is packed with symbolism. Yeah. Just amazing. Huh. All over. Yeah. So if you listen throughout the work, and you hear that, that chromatic line, yeah. you need to look at the text and say, why is he using that here? Yeah. What does that mean? And the ascending, right. Yeah. That reminds me just the ascent or the inverted at version. At the very end, et vitam venturi, seculi amen. Right, but even at the, in the first movement with the big oboe solo near the, near the end, da 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 if I have that right. Yeah. Um, it, it just reminds me so much of that. And this, this piece throughout features soloists from the, from the orchestra as well as the soloists you know, in the front. Um, it, there's a f big flute solo, an oboe solo, a horn solo with clarinet solo. Um, it's, uh, it, tell, me, tell me about the orchestration of this. We have full colors of orchestra in this piece. Uh, we can, you know, what's, what's one of the most um, beautiful places for me is during a horn solo, uh, the double, ba double basses uh, are playing. So we have completely two opposite, you know, of the um, registers. Mm -hmm. And uh, how he combines music by the different instruments um, also, when we have the solos, uh, it's the time when we don't have text, and for me, it's a special time when we need to think, like time for our minds and just to melt the text. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's part of the journey, also uh, during the credo, during the text of the credo, and for me, it's the time for him to analyze, do I believe, mm. do I believe? Mm -hmm. And this is what we just finished in the other section. Mm. And um, 
the orchestra, the, the, we have huge orchestra, a lot of instruments. Mm -hmm. We have also instruments um, in the banda, so nella sala, they, they will be back to you. Um, we, I think we have to clarify that yeah. for the audience. So you have a balcony brass group. Yeah. Three trumpets on one side, and then is it s four trumpets? Oh, four trumpets. Two trombones and two horns. Yes. So they're going to be on either side, up in the top balcony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are sounds from the heaven, right. and they are also in the very particular places. Mm -hmm. uh, you you will see that they will have a dialogue between stage and the heaven. So um, it's really uh, what what Katie said also with the texture wh with the text. Um, we have, when, when choir is uh, singing about going Jesus to the heaven, we have melody uh, with going up. Then when we have the time when, when, he, uh, when Jesus is d dies, mm -hmm. um, instrumentation is very soft. Mm -hmm. When we sing about um, happiness, uh, long life in the heavens, we have full orchestra. We feel the the exciting of the of the composer. So he, it's much more easier to understand also text thanks to the music mm -hmm. in, in this particular piece. Mm -hmm. And I just would say to the assembled audience, and I, it, it's critical with any composition by with chorus, um, is to understand that a composer does not set randomly. But a great composer sets text intentionally. Mm -hmm. So when you're hearing music, as Anna said, if it's full, if it sounds joyous, if it sounds um, soft, ask yourself, what is the composer saying? Look at the text mm -hmm. and ask yourself what is being projected. So the Holy Spirit, the descent of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary conceives of Christ. That's where this amazing solo occurs uh, in the, is the flute, is that right? And then you've got the sound of the last trumpet. I mean, that's prophecy. It's actually the last trombone, I think, which is, in German, it's the sound of the, final, of the last trombone rather than trumpet. But it's prophecy, it's yeah. vision. You know, all of these solo instrument passages are linked, as Anna said, to his faith and what he is trying to say. And so often, he sets the text differently, like, Places you would see in other composers that would be jubilant and celebratory are mysterious and dark because I think he just, he sits at the feet of God and looks up mm -hmm. and he is awestruck yeah. mm -hmm. by what he's seeing. So that's the other thing. It, it is in, um, when I, I confess the Holy Catholic Church, the, the confession of the baptism, very quiet and mystical, mm -hmm. you know. So it's fascinating to see his faith so clearly projected in this work. Yeah. The, the piece is uh, in arch form. That's right. Um, some of you may know what that means. Usually in an arch form, you have odd number of movements for a reason that I'll explicate here in a second. In, and there's two ways of looking at the credo. There's, there's either five movements or there's seven movements, depending on how you... Uh, conceive of the uh, atakas. Um, arch form means that you have basically, in, well, let's say it's in five movements, A, B, C for each of the movements, A, B, C, and then B, A. So the outer movements are bookended, and then the penultimate and the second movement are, are, are bookended, and then there's a central movement. Uh, many composers have utilized this function essentially to highlight this central movement. And in the Credo's case, we're talking about the crucifixus, which is the behemoth. It's a huge movement. And there's a few things that are special about this. And you mentioned right before we uh, sat down, there's a, a, a language yeah. thing with that crucifixus. But, but okay, maybe uh, maybe I'm not correct, but I have feeling that the resurrection is, is the in the in the C, right? No, the crucifix Crucifixes? Is, is the C. Okay. So that's the center movement, the four, and if you go out from there, three is et incarnatus, and five is et resurrexit, 
Two is qui propter nos, and six is et in spiritu. Ah, okay. One is credo, and seven is okay, et Okay, okay, okay. So when we're talking about the seven, okay. Yeah. And that's called a chiastic structure yeah. used by Bach, yeah. used by Brahms, used right. by many, many composers, right. all of which Penderecki knew. Yeah. It was okay. so intentional, and he started with the crucifixes. He didn't finish it first, but he started with the centrals. That central idea. It's a powerful movement. Yeah, so, so, I so the, um, you, you need to know that it's only one, in this part, um, we have three languages. Uh, languages. Uh, we have Latin, uh, we have uh, Polish, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and what is what's very difficult for the singers, uh, but they are doing even better than I. Oh. Uh, so it's, it's really perfect. And we have only four. Uh, bars um, in German. Um, so you have to also remember that for the Penderecki, um, he wanted to compose ecumenic piece, uh, which showed that we can be together even if we are in different churches. So the, Protestant, so the German melody is the, um, from the Protestant uh, hymn. Hymn? Aus, yes, Aus, Aus tiefer Not. Out of the depths I cry to thee. Yeah. And uh, the Polish text and melody, um, they are from two um, very traditional uh, songs. Um, they are not hymned because the text, it's not from the Bible. But um, in Polish church, um, we really have, we, we adorate a lot um, the crisis death mm. and the, um, just before the Easter on Friday, uh, it's very big adoration, celebration, celebration. I don't know how to say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in English, but uh, we sang, uh, we sang a lot uh, this day, and these two songs are very old. Uh, so uh, first um, song uh, is um, is performed by the choir children. And it's Który za nas cierpiał rany, Jezu Chryste, zmiłuj się nad nami. I sing it for you, just to realize during performance when they are singing. Mm -hmm. Because the, what is very tricky, it's melody, um, of course, in my church, in our church, perform mostly the old woman, right? So it, it sounds differently than children um, and it shouldn't be sung by children because we are talking about text is talking about that you Christ that because of us of you know adults things right our bad thing hmm. children doesn't have bad stories you know so it's like even more deeper when you hear that from mm. from the angels let's say and then we have a second uh, song, uh, which is uh, singing by the choir. Uh, and the rest. Um, you could do the rest if you like. Faraona, <laughs> So it's, um, it's different, uh, use the other, uh, other stroke, but it's, it's depend of the, um, the, the, the text. But the, what I wanted to say, it's so powerful when you realized uh, that the special section is added because he wanted to stay more with our um, fault, like sins, like, wow. yes, that think about it, mm. why, why it happened, you know, even if you don't believe, of course, um, just what, do, what are we doing in, in this world? Can, do we be better people or how it looks, right? Mm. So there are eight different textual or musical interpolations. That means insertions of text outside of the mass text. Mm -hmm. So Anna has just referred to three of them, which all come from Holy Week text, hymns, or songs. Um, 
but there are also two others in Latin, Crux Fidelis, which is faithful cross above all others, and the Pange, Pange Lingua, single tongue, the glorious battle. So though all five of these, mm -hmm. the two Polish texts, the German Lutheran text, out of the depths I credit thee, these two Latin texts, they're all in the crucifixus. And then there are three other Easter Sunday insertions. One is from Revelation 11:15. then the seventh angel sounded trumpet. And then you've got Psalm 118, mm -hmm. this is the day the Lord has made. And then you've got Salva Festa Dias, Hail Festa Day. Mm -hmm. So again, when you hear, you may not always be able to distinguish when those interp interpolations are occurring, um, but it's exactly, as Anna said, he went beyond mm -hmm. the liturgical Latin mass text and added this personal statement. And it is stunningly beautiful um, when you hear those moments, but you need to, again, look at the supertitles and say, what is he trying to say here? And also, sorry, I just re uh, forgot that it's time when we are singing, it's like a funeral. It's, mm -hmm. it's like funeral because uh, in, in, in Poland, we exactly sing that because of the funeral of the Jesus Christ. So it's so powerful that he put it in this piece just to remind you that it's part of this story. Mm. And um, many years ago, it was like that, right? Mm. It was real funeral for, for his mother, uh, friends. Mm. So it's, it's really powerful. But looking, looking beyond Holy Week, he is always projecting yeah. Easter Sunday yeah. in those final musical insertions, right. which come later. Right. I'm struck, though, before we leave the crucifixus, um, the sound of the church bells with the brass, these dong, dong, just these, oh, it's gorgeous. And it just pervades all, all the way through this movement, and we get a little hints of it throughout. Um, it's a difficult section. Um, and I think it's important just to be clear, if it hasn't been already, this is the only movement, am I right in this, that there are these different languages, there are these different interpolations, or? or? No, it's not. The Revelation text, the Psalm text, yeah. the Salve Festitia, they come later. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, okay. But the three languages are only. But the three languages, yeah, yeah, right, the three, only here are the three languages, the German, the Latin, and the Polish. Yeah. Where, which brings together all of those. Right. Um, the, the, the next movement at Resurrexus, um, I'm surprised at how rhythmic this movement is. It, it just, especially after going through all first four movements, leading to the crucifixus, and then right after, it's this very different energy, very different vibe, very rhythmic. Yeah. I wonder if you could talk about that. You know, it's, it's a message like, wait what will wait for now mm. it's it will be very important thing and that's the point of this whole story be ready right yeah. I, for me it's something unexpected mm -hmm. and um so you, you also um need to know that um when it was premiere of course um every conductor has uh, different uh, idea for some parts but uh, during this 25 years we perform quite often this piece in Poland so um, after many many performance we have quite of the tradition in, in some places so when you compare the recording uh, from from the Oregon Bach Festival um, you will hear the difference also in the tempo in this um, mm. in this uh, movement uh, we will perform it a little bit faster um, because it's it's connected with the technique of the conducting how do you think about the aids is it in three or mm. one so it's wap -pa 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 or wap -pa 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 -pa. Yeah. you know it's tiny difference but it it makes difference in the in the mood mm -hmm. of the whole piece so um, Krzysztof Penderecki, after, after, because I talked with the, his close friend two weeks ago before, before coming here to be just sure in the some places, and Maciej Tworek, he told me that 
after a couple months, he realized that he really would like to push this um, movement even more, just to have um, the powerful vivace, which is the, the faster tempo, uh, to remind the people that we are, ha you know, it's, we, we, we have more speed, like, Speeding up, yeah, or? we're speeding up to discover the main message of the speech. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like, et, re, zu, re. we need to be excited, you know? Yeah. What's going on? What's going on? Right. And I, I, I anticipated this because I know that Helmut was less comfortable yeah. with doing one two, uh, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one. So he conducted every eighth yeah. note, but I didn't do that uh -huh. because I'm comfortable with mixed meter and I'm comfortable yeah. conducting in one or, or the flexible changing. And I anticipated that she would also do this. Uh -huh. So this, I think, is also partly linked to what, Hel as Helmut approached it, in terms of his precision and yeah. what he was going for. I also remember, though, the, what's the slappy percussion thing? The, yeah, the boo bomb. What is it? The boo bomb. Bo say it again. I'm the boo bomb. It's a membryophonic. And is there a percussionist in the house? It's like a mem membranophonic yeah. instrument. But I remember the recording, it was very tricky. Just, just <laughs> it was like a whack-a-mole kind of thing. Yeah, and there, were all, there was only like one or two boobums in the United States. I, yes. We, like they had to locate it, fly it in, all of that. Did you have to do that, James? Yeah. Came up from LA. <laughs> okay. It's a, Maybe it, there are a couple more boobums now, but I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, it was a highly unusual instrument. We had never heard it. It, it is pitched, mm -hmm. but it's really hard to take a pitch from it. Yeah, and uh, you, you need to know that also the part of, of this movement and of the last movement, which is very rhythmical in the some places, it's like spots uh, which I have in mind even when I sleep, really. <laughs> like, <laughs> sometimes, yeah. I have it, you, I open the eyes and it's like, whoa, no, oh, yeah. uh, all, like, uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, you, you just need to repeat that, repeat that, because you need to feel that. If you think about it too much during conducting, you are lost. Yeah. So it's tricky. So my final question for both of you is what can we, ex it's been 25 years since this premiere and the pieces lived on, uh, been recorded, performed uh, in that time. How has it changed? What can we expect from both of you in terms of uh, your own new feeling about this, this work? Kathy, I wonder if, you, if you've prepared it in a slightly different way. Actually, I think I should let Anna I'll, I'll speak get to, to Anna. <laughs> but I wonder first, All right, have I'll you prepared it in a slightly different way having let it simmer for 25 years? Uh, I would say that I did anticipate the fact that the tempi would be faster, mm -hmm. even though like some of these, ten and there are tempi where we agreed it was notated too fast and it would be slower. But uh, I knew Helmut Rilling very well and mm -hmm. I knew his comfort level yeah. with mixed meter. So right. I also knew of Anna's you know, technique, baton technique, and right. I knew that she would be able to handle that in a different way. Yeah. So uh, I would say that that was informed what I did. Um, also, the chorus is a different chorus than it was then. Mm -hmm. And they've been able to listen to a recording. So I think we all came in much more informed yeah. about what we needed to do and how we would approach that. Yeah. Um, right. And I will tell you that we had soloists from the chorus who rehearsed, who came out of the course and did our rehearsals also mm. with Anna. And that was incredible luxury mm. because we didn't really have that available to us. Mm -hmm. So the connecting tissue of the soloists throughout this work, again, we had singers who could go to a recording, listen to it, think about it, and from the chorus provide that information. Mm. So those are all different things. Yeah. You know, it's, you're coming at it knowing so much more. Yeah. And I have to say it's much easier. It's much easier, I, for sure now than 25 years yes. ago, because you you have to know that even um, if you have, rec of course, w I don't study with the recording because you have to conduct and you have to know it inside of you, and you just need to study that to understand. 
But you know, even during the journey or even during the day when I'm cooking, I can just listen that and p part of my brain can take it. Mm -hmm. Then it's much easier to open the score, to sing that study. I didn't have to take every bar by bar mm -hmm. on the piano. Mm -hmm. It takes so many time for me because I am a string player. Mm -hmm. Not so, mm -hmm. you know, I, I do it, but when I need that. So I had a couple spots when I needed to, mm -hmm. to play and to hear how, how it sounds, but it's much easier for me. Uh, when I was during the many performance in Poland and you just know the piece. Mm -hmm. So uh, imagine that you have a symphony, Beethoven symphony, which you need to explore from the very beginning. It's not so big deal right now for the orchestras because they know that you can have the di different interpretation, but you know how it's going, mm -hmm. right? So um, for me, um, it's big adventure uh, for sure. Also with the Tempis, um, I need to say that my heart sometimes, you know, Go is very fast. fast yeah. So um, also with the experience, I think you you can trust more. You trust more your body. So that's why I'm always asking solists. I'm always asking Katy, what do you think? Because mm -hmm. it's very difficult at the beginning to to. Um, trust, mm. to trust you, y yourself. And um, the last thing what I want to add that oh, it's a really big honor for me. It's something special. Um, it's one of the biggest concert in my life. And um, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful and I still can't imagine, I can't believe that you trusted me. <laughs> that it's not easy, you know, to have um, young conductor and um, I, I'm very, very moved. Uh, so big thank you. Um, I spoke with Elizabeth Penderecka. Uh, mm. I met her uh, last month and she's very uh, moved and uh, happy. She couldn't be here because of the health issues, but um, it means a lot also for her. Well, I think it's gonna mean a lot to all of us to see this concert tomorrow and I, feel honored to be able to talk to both of you today. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you at the show. Take care. You are welcome to look at this score. Turn pages. You'll see Helmut's markings and you see Pendretsky's notation. <laughs>